All right, everyone. Well, if you're watching the clock, the hour has just turned, and in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and begin today's webinar. For those that aren't aware, this is actually the second installment, uh, the second time that we're running through this webinar. It has been such a hot topic that we actually oversubscribed the number of seats that were available, both in the original presentation and for today. So clearly, this is something that you're all very concerned about. Getting ready as we approach the end of the year to have a nice, clean, tidy wrap up to our operations this year, and then looking forward to planning for 2020. Um, everyone, my name is Ryan Miller. I'm the founder and the CEO of Aetna Interactive, one of the medical industry's leading digital marketing firms. And for nearly a decade, we've enjoyed a fantastic partnership with BSM Consulting. I am incredibly excited today to welcome Elizabeth Monroe, senior consultant with BSM, to talk about her experience in um, really exceptional practice operations. I think for me, what's most exciting isn't just Elizabeth's experience as a consultant within BSM, but her personal experience having been the COO for a large practice and really understanding intimately what all of us are dealing with as we're looking at rounding out this year. So Elizabeth, without further ado, what I wanna do is I wanna pass it over to you and remind everyone throughout the presentation today that the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen is gonna be the best way to pass in questions that I can moderate as Elizabeth is walking us through her presentation. Well, thanks so much, Ryan. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all. And uh, I'm excited to talk about practice operations today. And I put the title on our title slide today, Get Her Done Before 2020. So we're gonna talk about a lot of different areas in the office for you to consider in your practices and how you might be able to, again, as Ryan said, you really kind of get prepared for the new year and how to make sure that everything's rolling correctly for you uh, before we turn that calendar. You know, uh, Ryan shared with you that I used to run a large practice in Florida and uh, life just sometimes completely gets crazy in practices and I understand that more than anyone. So we're really going to talk today about how to uh, get ourselves organized and be able to focus on those topics that are really important to us. I just gave you a little bit of a background uh, slide uh, for my uh, shoes that I have walked in in my practice, uh, but I just wanted to, again, to build on what Ryan shared is that, you know, I have had those sleepless nights where you wake up in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. and think, oh my goodness, I don't know if we're doing this in the practice or I don't know if this is being done. And so we're really going to talk today about some strategies about how we can better uh, support our physicians and better support our staff members uh, to make sure that we're in compliance and we're moving things right along. So I just really have one objective for today. I just want to review some areas uh, and compliance that you really should be paying attention to uh, and again, get it ready before 2020. I'm sharing with you uh, one of my absolute favorite sayings, and I found it one day reading the Harvard Business Review Management Tip of the Day. It's a little email service that uh, HBR sends out, and you can sign up for it. It's free. And I saw this quote, and it said, you get one point for thinking about something, you get nine points for actually doing it, and it's a Walmart executive who said it. And I have really taken this saying, and I actually have it up in my office for me to look at every day because, you know, we constantly are bombarded with things that, number one, need to get done, but sometimes it's really hard to prioritize what those should be. And, you know, how many of you have had a doctor come to you and given you something else to put on your, your list, and you're like, yes, that's, that's on my list, but the problem is, you know, they don't really know where it is on your list. Uh, it might have been on your list now for several months. And the point is, you know, what do we actually need to do within our organizations, within our practices to get our full 10 points and get the operational items that we're going to talk about today done? So I just really want to 
hopefully inspire and challenge all of you today to think about some of these areas. It's okay if you're not doing everything perfectly. No one is. I can just share that with you. No one out there is. But, you know, let's organize and think about the areas that you really do need to focus on uh, to improve your practice operations. We're going to start off today with compliance training and talking about are you current in your state and federal requirements. You know, I shared with you that no one is 100% compliant, and I can just share with you, I have been doing operational assessments for uh, practices throughout the United States, and I have not found one practice, not one, who's 100% current on compliance training. So even if you think you're 100% compliant, I would just uh, encourage everyone to go back and double check. Uh, I just did a remote audit for a practice yesterday and they're really saying, yes, everybody in our, our um, practice takes courses on these areas of compliance. But when I did an audit of their staff roster, they're running about 45% where everyone's completed um, their training. So again, we, we think folks have done this, but maybe they haven't. We're going to start off today by talking about OSHA. And just some of the important um, areas within OSHA that we need to be reviewing within our practices. And uh, ironically, Ryan, I'll just give a little plug. Um, BSM Consulting has a blog. It's free. Anyone can register for it. And a couple of minutes before our webinar today, I just saw the BSM blog for this week's installment was written by uh, a registered nurse who's a, a, a senior consultant at BSM, JoLynn Cook, and she is talking about OSHA and OSHA requirements. So uh, we can definitely make that available, Ryan, um, when we send out the slides to folks who've attended the webinar. Uh, but certainly, folks, if you are interested in having just some additional training uh, or even some of the links on, you know, how do I find OSHA training, where is it located, you know, those links um, to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration can get you pointed in the right direction. Definitely. I think that's, if you don't mind, Elizabeth, I'll, I'll jump in there. For everyone who's on the call, we are recording today's uh, webinar. Uh, within about 72 hours of the recording, we'll have cleaned up the video and made that available online. You'll receive an email, and the email will um, link so that you can watch the recording webinar. And Elizabeth, we'll make sure to get from you the link to that most latest blog post to include in that distribution for everybody who's uh, registered for today. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ryan. That's outstanding. So within your practice, uh, with your OSHA training, we just want to make sure that every single employee who comes into the practice has their initial training as part of their orientation or onboarding. And then every single year, your practice conducts annual OSHA training to make sure that everyone has received that training for your practice. We want to make sure that you have a practice manual that details policies and procedures. And, you know, I give you the link for the OSHA uh, website. We'll, we'll make sure that that's there and that's in the blog I referenced. Uh, but, you know, some of those uh, materials are more suited to hospitals, right? And so um, what I used to do in my practice, um, you know, there are some really great OSHA um, courses that are specifically geared to medical practices as opposed to hospital setting. Uh, but I also would take some of the information from the OSHA website and I would modify it again to really be the important areas for my practice that I knew we needed to deal with. Some of the key components you need to have in your policy and procedure and part of your training is blood board pathogens standards. So you're really just outlining, you know, what's going to happen with uh, any of your biohazardous waste that leaves the practice that's picked up for incineration. Uh, you also need to have a hazard communication standard, and typically that will include a material safety data sheet, or MSDS. And that's really to communicate to your employees any hazardous chemical products that may be located within 
your practice. And OSHA has uh, 16 areas that they want you to detail some of those um, hazardous chemical products that are there in your practice. Having a spill kit and wash station. Uh, you know, we um, had these within our practices, but I often found that when we had new employees, we'd go through it with orientation, but some folks would just sort of forget where it is, or they might transfer now to a different office if you have more than one location. So it's just really important, again, to make sure that you do this annually, that if you did have a situation that your team knows where all of these things are. And then if your staff members uh, have any exposure or are working medically alongside the doctor, having a policy where they can opt in or opt out to hepatitis B vaccinations is something that's important. The next area that we're going to talk about here is HIPAA, which is our Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And what we're really doing here with this particular policy is we are protecting the confidentiality uh, of our uh, patients within the practice. Certainly HIPAA has a lot of other components to it, including how uh, insurance is handled for your employees. But in regards to our training and how we want to focus that for our employees for operations, we really want to make sure that our teams are uh, thinking about patient um, confidentiality and that we have the proper documentation in place to handle all of our patient records. So again, we want to make sure that every single employee that passes through our practice has initial training and then once a year we do annual training with our entire team. And another big component that uh, you want to go back through and make sure that your HIPAA policy addresses is a couple of years ago, we had um, an addition to HIPAA that was related to the High Tech Act. So many of us in our practices, um, we may be on electronic health records, but even if we're not on EHR, then most of us have all of our patient demographic information, which includes social security numbers, in some instances, credit card numbers uh, in our practice management systems. And so we really need to make sure that we are doing an annual risk assessment of our IT functions within our practices and that we are managing all of the um, components to make sure that our, our data is as secure as possible. And Elizabeth, if I, if I can, I think you know, this conversation about HIPAA and the idea and the importance of that annual audit, um, you know, looking beyond IT as well to look at your marketing functions and your agency partnerships, increasingly as we see, you know, I know we have today on our call, we have representatives from ophthalmology practices, dermatology practices, plastic surgery practices. I saw uh, at least one spine surgery practice in the group. Increasingly, I know that we have staff members and agencies that are participating both in social media and responding to patient reviews online. During that annual audit, you know, we always recommend as well, it's time to think about that part of the organization and make sure those contributors understand how to protect patient privacy and observe HIPAA inside of the, the social marketing sphere. Absolutely, Ryan. Uh, you know, we will recommend to, to practices that they teach their teams that even if a patient is outlining something within the social media post that could be self-identifying, you know, they're the ones who have written it. Uh, even our staff, though, has to really refrain from responding in any way that is going to be a HIPAA violation. It's much better to see if we can um, reach out to that person, thank them for their comment, and then uh, see if we can't connect with them offline so that we're not posting anything in a social media forum that could later be uh, a detriment in regards to our HIPAA, viola our HIPAA policies within our practices. Another area that we want to take a look at within HIPAA are our business associates agreement for vendors with access to protected health information. Uh, so um, it, you really don't need to necessarily have a BAA in place for every single vendor that you work with, 
but I do have practices just as a safety precaution. They go ahead and have all of the vendors um, complete the BAA, uh, but we're really just looking for any outside vendor that you work with who could potentially have access to your patient's protected health information. You know, that could potentially be your, your PM system if they do outside billing, um, if you've got a bookkeeper who is an outside entity, an independent contractor who remotes in to do your books but has access to your PM uh, system, you know, any kinds of any vendors with that kind of access remotely will need to sign a BAA. The other piece that we want to have for HIPAA is our Notice of Privacy Policy, or our NPP. This is really a guideline in how your practice deals with patient protected information. And um, there's not, uh, if you go onto the HIPAA website, you know, there's not an actual manual that you can download, but they do give very specific guidelines on the things that need to be included in your NPP. And you can go online, find that, and outline what those are. And then uh, when you have patients who sign that they uh, understand how you deal with their protected information, uh, certainly you don't have to give them the entire manual every time they check in, but you wanna have the NPP in a binder at the front desk. And if a patient ever asked a question, then your team would be able to reference and give the patient the notebook for them to be able to read over the full policy uh, of how you handle their information. And we just want to make sure that's available for them at the front desk. Another area of compliance that we want to talk about today is fraud, waste, and abuse. And this is probably one of the most neglected areas. You know, it hasn't been around as long as OSHA and HIPAA. I remember when I was in my practice, when I first started to have to um, have annual training for fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, but again, we wanna have that be that initial and our annual training. Um, but we're really, these are oftentimes uh, related to any Medicare or Medicare Advantage plans that your practice might accept. Um, if you are a completely cosmetic practice and you don't accept Medicare on assignment, this may not be um, relevant to you specifically, but for all of our other practices, uh, dermatology, ophthalmology, spine, who do take Medicare on assignment, uh, you want to make sure that you're completing this initial and your annual training. And I thought that I would just um, share with you uh, kind of how I did compliance month in my practice. Um, we would have the month of May be designated as our compliance month. I don't know why we selected May. It just sort of ended up like that. And then I was in Florida. And so our last uh, week of the month, we would do um, emergency preparedness and hurricane preparedness. And we would just go over all of our policies for um, e our emergencies. And uh, hurricane season started on uh, June 1st. And so that was just really kind of how we ended up doing it. We would start off by playing games together. We would do Jeopardy or Who Wants to Be a Millionaire for OSHA and HIPAA. Uh, I'd have my staff study the materials we provided in our practice on one week. And then the next week we'd come together and play games. And I would tell them, you can bring any study resource, any study resource, online, printed, whatever, uh, to come and play the games and we would just have a lot of fun together and we had great prizes that we would hand out every single year. We had another week where we would do fraud, waste, and abuse and then as I shared with you, we would end the month with our emergency preparedness plan, um, you know, talking about some of those more serious issues, what we do when something's coming our way. So if you haven't had your training yet this year, Pick a month between now and the end of the year where you're going to go ahead and get your all of your training up to date. And then in the future, you can pick any month and just have that be your compliance month. And then your team knows we're all going to train, we're all going to do this together, and we're going to get the whole practice done at one time. 
And the last area that I wanted to just make sure that we talked about in regards to operations and compliance is if your practice is a part of that Medicare assignment. Uh, there are a couple of areas that you really want to make sure that your practice is paying attention to uh, in regards to operations and compliance. So our first area here is the OIG exclusion list. And OIG stands for the Office of Inspector General. And this is a list of individuals who have been identified by Medicare that, again, they're there's something in their background related to that fraud, waste, or abuse that we had on the previous slide. This could be a doctor, it could be a PA, it could be an optometrist, it could be a staff member, and it doesn't have to be a, a really horrible thing that they did to get themselves on this list. There, you know, there are some things that are a little bit more benign to get on the list. But if you have an employee or a physician on the list, they are not able to manage any type of billing, uh, coding, collection of payments for Medicare, um, Medicare beneficiaries until they can get themselves off the list. We recommend that practices check all of their employees and physicians against the OIG exclusion list. You just look people up by their names on a quarterly basis. So a lot of the practices that I work with, they just put an Outlook calendar reminder for the first of the month on every quarter. And then when that goes off, they have someone in the practice designated to look up the team uh, that's currently there on the list just to make sure that everyone has a clear bill of health to be able to work with Medicare patients. Another area that we want to make sure that we have um, in all of our consent paperwork, uh, specifically when we're doing the uh, assignment of Medicare benefits, uh, where we're having patients, Medicare patients sign that we can file claims on their behalf, is we need to have Medigap language. And if you need uh, that language specifically for your um, particular practice, um, they do make um, Medicare assignment of benefit forms, and those are on the CMS website. Uh, I just used to have those in my practice, and I would have all Medicare patients sign that uh, at the beginning of their relationship with us. It is a once-in-a-lifetime form. So once a patient signs it, you don't have to have them sign it every single year like you would a medical history questionnaire. You want to make sure that you have a compliance plan. And uh, these also can be found online. Um, CMS, Medicare publishes um, uh, compliance plans that are um, just examples that you can take a look at. Uh, but you want to be able to document how your practice deals with billing and how your practice deals with uh, issues that come up uh, related to ethics in that, you know, if we discover we're doing something incorrectly in our practice, we're going to correct it. And this is how we're going to correct it. And then we're going to train our staff to correct these things. And so that's what a compliance plan will outline. And there are, are major components to a compliance plan that you can take a look at and then make sure you have that for your practice. I also recommend a billing and coding chart audit every one to two years uh, if you bill outside to commercial payers or to Medicare. Um, I used to have in my practice a billing and coding chart audit every two years. And you know, I just did it because uh, number one, it was the right thing to do. I needed to make sure we were doing all of the billing and coding correctly. But number two, I would always set it up to where the billing and coding auditor that was coming in would take some time to train our staff and train our doctors on the right way to do things. So if we added physicians or if we added staff to our billing team, uh, they always had then that consistent training and we all were billing and coding the right way. And then if you are um, uh, currently participating in MIPS, um, you know, there are a lot of great resources online if you're still concerned about that. I know a lot of um, 
uh, practices that I work with are starting really very heavily to pull their reports and making sure that their uh, EHR is capturing the necessary measures for their particular specialty. Uh, so that's something that if you haven't done that yet uh, this year, go ahead and start pulling your reports to make sure that you're able to download that data. Uh, there should be uh, some data for each of the measures you're planning to report on, and then you can talk with your EHR vendor uh, if for some reason things aren't pulling correctly. And so those are the primary areas that I wanted to discuss in regards to compliance. We're now going to spend a little bit of time on talking about our front desk operations. I know that when um, we talk about front desk operations, there's a lot that goes on, right? And that's getting more and more complex for our front office. And there's so many things you have to do. You have to get the insurance number in the right spot in the PM system, or when you file the claim, things don't go right. You know, there's just a lot for our front office to manage and to remember. So I have up here on the slide to create awesome systems. And I put that there because, you know, we really as managers, as operators, sometimes have to take a step back look at some of our systems, are they working well? And if not, figure out what's not and correct it. And so it's a, it's a constant system where we are trying to upgrade and fix and promote our, our front desk operations. So the first area that I'd love for you to take a look at before 2020 are your patient recalls. You know, are your patients coming back? And many of us in our specialties, we tend to build our practices on recurring patient relationships. In most practices, your new patients are going to be somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of your patient population. It might be a little bit more um, in some specialties, maybe a little bit less if you're a really established practice. But you know, we're, we're typically hoping that we've got that kind of number of new patients coming in. Well, that presupposes then that the other 75% of our patients are folks that have already seen us, liked us, liked our doctors or our providers, and have come back for a recurring treatment or a recurring exam. And if we don't have a recall put in place for that patient, uh, they may it, we just may kind of fall off their radar and not be remembered in, oh, yeah, I have to do that, or, oh, yes, it's time for this treatment. And so we really want to make sure that we have recalls in place. I've always said before a patient leaves, they need to either have in the system an appointment or a recall, meaning a way that we're going to reach out to them, whether it's email, text message, voicemail of something in the mail reminding them to get with us and to schedule their next appointment. The other area that we really want to uh, talk about is uh, patient outreach. And Ryan already touched a little bit on this. Um, he, he, Ryan and I have presented on uh, hiring front desk staff who have social media skills and, you know, who really play a huge role in marketing, being an ambassador for the practice. And so uh, as you think about creating awesome systems, uh, you know, if you have created a social media outlet for patients to be able to reach you about their appointments or about their experience within the practice, then, you know, we really need to have someone in the practice monitoring those different outlets. Many practices that I work with, those folks exist in the front desk. Uh, sometimes they are other people within the practice, but we want to make sure that we're not losing any of our patients uh, by them reaching out to us and us not having someone in place who can manage those inquiries. The other area that I want to talk about is just the availability with your providers. You know, how many of you have had a provider come to you and say, no one's monitoring my schedule, or I have too many patients on today, I can't see that many, or vice versa, I don't have enough patients. You know, the schedule for providers 
it's always going to be a work in progress. It's never going to be that moment where you've just arrived. But there has to be somebody in the practice, uh, typically that's a front desk person, a manager, um, administrator, who's monitoring the provider's schedule and giving direction to our front desk that you know we need to move some patients, we need to schedule more, uh, we've got availability over here, um, and then having that communication piece back with the providers as well. And last but not least is our relationships with our referring providers. Uh, if you, when a patient checks in right now, are not tracking the um, referring uh, providers or, you know, how did you hear about us? Many folks ask that question or they ask that question in their patient uh, paperwork. We really want to be documenting how patients find us. And in so many of our practices, regardless of specialty, it's the relationships that we have with those referring providers or those referring vendors that funnel patients towards our organizations. And so we want to make sure we track that. And if you are tracking it, I really encourage you to run a report on a monthly basis just to understand where your uh, patients are coming from and to be able to continue to reach out to your referring providers. You know, every once in a while, pick up the phone and say, hey, are we doing a good job for you? I mean, I'm assuming because they're still referring to you that you are, but at the same time, there could be something that your practice could help them with. Um, maybe a, a difficult patient, maybe they need better letters or better documentation from you. Uh, by just checking in with them, uh, to see if there's something you can do, oftentimes that really just keeps that relationship fluid and keeps you all in good communication. We're now going to spend a little bit of time on clinical operations and uh, talk about how we can improve our practices on the back office side of things. And Elizabeth, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but before you go, go um, deeper into the, the new section, I do want to remind everybody on the call that throughout the call, feel free to use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. You'll have to hover over the presentation. Click on that little icon to open the new window to post questions throughout the presentation. We'll accumulate those and uh, be able to ask those of Elizabeth as we wrap up today. Sorry about that, Elizabeth. Let me pass it right back to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Ryan. So we're going to talk a little bit about monitoring our patient wait times. And, you know, patient wait times really, um, uh, patients waiting is one of the single most distressing thing to them. And I know Ryan has shared statistics before about how it is, uh, you know, one of the highest ranked things that patients complain about online. <laughs> so when we're trying to do our uh, reputation management, if we have patients who are having to wait a really long time for uh, us to call them back from the uh, waiting room or if they're having to wait a long time to see the provider or even if just the entire length of the visit is way outside industry norms or way outside of what they are expecting, they will complain about it and they will be vocal about it to other folks. So. You know, a lot of times the question comes up to me when I'm working with practices, particularly about flow and efficiency, is, you know, how do we hold our clinical staff accountable? How do we help our doctors stay accountable in regards to, um, you know, getting patients through their schedules? And, you know, I wish I could tell you that I have a magic bullet that's going to fix this for you on every level, but there really isn't such a thing because there are a lot of different factors that go into a practice uh, in, in why we run behind. Uh, but I will share with you something that I love to share with practices in that there are typically three reasons why you run behind. There's either not a room available to take the patient in. There's not a person available to take the patient back or the person who's supposed to take the patient back doesn't know it or isn't there to take the patient back. It's usually one of those three things. So as you're thinking about your patient wait times, that might be something that you just sort of start to boil things down to their simplest, leanest forms. Where do patients go and who's available to take them back? 
And so to be able to help us with our patient wait times, you know, we really want to make sure that we're using real data. Many of you who are using electronic health records have a tremendous opportunity because your EHR will allow you to timestamp different areas of your exam, and then you can pull reports that indicate uh, how long it's really taking patients to get through your system. For others, if you don't have that, um, you can conduct a time study, again, through your EHR or just the old fashioned way where um, we document where a patient goes and how long they stay in each of the different areas within our clinic. And I just always remind folks that every single one of us, me, your doctors, Ryan, uh, your staff members, we only have 60 minutes. It's the one thing in all of our practices that are completely universal. And so we just have to figure out how then to break those 60 minutes down in the most efficient manner possible for our patients. And I have on here to brainstorm with your team for bottlenecks in the process. And I'm gonna move on to the next slide to also share with you another favorite quote that I have. In, in that the answers are within your four walls. I will oftentimes have practices call me, I have doctors who call me who say, Elizabeth, we're running behind, we can't figure it out. I come on site, I do an assessment, I look at everything, I talk with the staff, and your staff, they know what some of the things that need to happen to help improve overall practice flow and efficiency. So certainly if you get uh, really stuck and you need an outside consultant, um, you know, th those exist within all of the industries within uh, medical professions. But before you do that, take some time to gather your team, talk with them, listen to them about their concerns, and you know, they know the things that are in your practice that are causing bottlenecks and time issues with patients. We sometimes just have to take a step back and listen to them and really process what they're telling us uh, to be able to move things along. So before you go from 2019 to 2020, if you're suffering from, uh, from flow and efficiency issues within your practice, Set up a brainstorming session with your team and come up with a great game plan for you all to execute against in the new year. And last but not least, in as far as our back office, I just want to touch base on clinical training uh, for our staff. So this would be for your medical assistants, your technicians, scribes, patient care coordinators within your practice. You know, I think we are at an absolute all-time low of finding skilled workers in the U.S. that we can simply plug into these kinds of positions within our practices. Most of us are going to have to uh, hire from the outside and hire to culture and then train them to work within our specialties that we have. But, you know, having uh, new clinical staff or folks who aren't trained to their maximum is one of the, our single biggest pressure points for our doctors because it directly impacts their lives and can really compromise their ability to offer the outstanding seamless care to patients that they want to offer. So, uh, you know, having clinical training plans in place for each of these positions is one of the uh, real critical points within our practices. So if your practice doesn't have a great training plan for your clinical staff, you just want to start outlining the different areas that each new person coming in your practice needs to learn and then come up with that systematic program for onboarding new folks and providing them a structured ongoing training platform from your vendors and your providers. And I can just share with you that in my practice, I mean, we got lucky every once in a while to hire someone with experience, but mostly we just couldn't find people in our area that had the medical expertise that we needed. So um, I, within my first year there at the practice, I had all of the different departments create a training checklist for their team members, and we kept those on file in a binder. And whenever we had a new person start, 
we would pull out the checklist for their department. Um, you know, we had some standard ones for you know all of the training and onboarding for everybody that was universal, but then for our individual skill sets. And we had our team members write those for us because I wasn't an expert in each one of those positions. And I certainly couldn't have done all of that by myself. So um, get everybody in your practice involved if this is an area that needs uh, some additional review before next year. And we're going to spend now just a little bit of time talking about business compliance. So just a few areas that I'll mention here. Um, we want to make sure that we have copies of all of our third party insurance contracts. And some of you may be sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know where mine are. So it's okay to go on a little bit of a scavenger hunt to look for them. But, you know, just think, when's the last time I saw one of my third-party insurance contracts? Do I even know where they are? And do I know what I'm being paid? Uh, so uh, we just want to make sure that we have a good understanding of our insurance contracts. If you are, again, a Medicare um, provider, uh, you know, how are you doing on your enrollment? Are, um, you know, if uh, are your pr providers coming up for renewal? I have a client who just recently updated all of her physicians on the PICO system, and she ran into some issues trying to upload her documents, so we had to get on the phone and work through that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's it's never easy, but it's something that has to be done. And if you're in a bigger practice, we just want to make sure that we know where all of our Medicare credentialing is. For provider credentialing, um, we, again, we just want to make sure that we're really up to date on all of our contracts and, you know, making sure that these things don't sneak up on us. And it's also really important to make sure that our providers are appropriately credentialed. Um, I was in a practice recently where um, had a provider, not an MD, a non-MD provider seeing patients but they were billing underneath the MD's um, NPI number, but the MD never saw the patient. And so it, it looked like from a signature standpoint on the patient's exam that the MD had completed the exam, but that patient only saw the non-MD provider. And in, um, in, in insurance and Medicare, that's a big no-no. That would go underneath that fraud category. So if you have any providers who are seeing patients um, and they're not credentialed correctly on that plan, we need to make sure that we go back and get that credentialing or reassign that patient to a provider who's on that patient's plan. And then last but not least for our business compliance, we really want to make sure that we have good consent paperwork for our surgeries. Um, if you are a practice that co-manages patients with other uh, physicians or providers in the area. Uh, there are, are guidelines and very specific um, items that must be followed in order to co-manage patients. And we need to make sure that all of our consent paperwork is really mitigating our risk uh, for malpractice suits within our patients. And so um, just depending on your specialty, I've always found that you can get some really great consent resources from your malpractice insurance carrier. So if you all haven't updated your consent paperwork for surgeries in a while, uh, just go back and uh, contact your malpractice insurance carrier and see if they've got any updated resources for you. And by the way, they are always, always happy to take your consent paperwork, read over it, and provide any guidance back to you. Um, you know, we, we all pay a lot in our malpractice insurance premiums, and that is one of the benefits is being able to ask them for their support and their help in those kinds of, of issues. And then one of the final areas that we're going to review today is our financial compliance. So I have a lot of practices and, and physicians who consistently ask me, Elizabeth, what reports should we be reviewing on a monthly basis? What should we be sitting down and talking about? And so I've just outlined for you uh, some of the uh, financial reports that I think can really give you a lot of great insights into your practice. So 
Our first one is the profit and loss statement or income statement. And what we're really wanting to monitor and manage here are three primary components. One are the revenues that are coming into the practice. These are rolled up typically through QuickBooks and our accountants or bookkeepers often will help us with these. Our expenses and how we're managing all the different areas within the practice. And then our overall profitability of the practice. And so our, our profit and loss statement, our income statement can show us those things. Next is the balance sheet, which will give us the overall general health of our practice. This would be typically what a bank might look at if we ever approach them for a loan to expand our business or to purchase new equipment. It's going to list all of your uh, assets, your liabilities, and the owner's equity. And I won't go into great detail about that report, but um, you know, there are certainly some great resources online that if you're not familiar with it, you can read over it. And um, again, it might be something you ask your accountant or bookkeeper to give you a quick tutorial on so that you know how to read those reports and can go over them with your owners. Uh, many of our specialties keep track of benchmarking and how we're doing, how we're comparing ourselves to other practices like practices in our specialty. And um, so having some sort of monthly benchmarking, I can share with you that, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of consulting firms out there kind of like BSM, but we benchmark against ourselves internally on certain um, aspects of our business. And so even if you're in a specialty and there's not a lot of outside data, you want to make sure that you start to track key measurements for yourself. You know, how many patients do you see each month? How many days do your doctors work each month? Um, you know, what are your, um, uh, your, your accounts aging, uh, your, your AR? And so I've got that next on the list, but those are all things that you can track against yourself if you don't have readily industry benchmarks that are out there. I mentioned the accounts receivable aging report, again, knowing how many days um, uh, it takes you from the time you see the patient to the time you get paid. Uh, provider productivity, helping them understand how productive they are being uh, within the clinic. Um, and then uh, certainly if we have any uh, service lines within our practices where we sell um, product, um, or we have some sort of an inventory system. We want to make sure that we consistently do product inventory reports and analysis and that we're managing that portion of our practice well. And I would have each of these reports printed out with me and sit down and have a monthly meeting with my doctors, hand them these reports on a monthly basis, and walk through them if they've got any questions or if I'm starting to see something that I think is unusual or that I just want to call their attention to. Uh, and uh, these types of reports can be tremendously helpful in allowing you to manage the practice well. And so I have talked about a lot of different areas here and you may be thinking, oh my goodness, Elizabeth, this is just a lot to do. And I, I get that. I, I, tr I truly do. And so I'm just going to share with you a couple of um, tools that I have found to be tremendously helpful to kind of take it from that, okay, that one point I thought about it to, again, now I need my nine points. I want a total of 10. How do I get things done? The most efficient way that I have found to do a communication plan with my doctors is to develop an action plan. And just so that you know, um, Ryan will probably mention this at the end of our um, presentation as well. Uh, when we send out the links to the webinar that uh, Ryan mentioned, we'll also make sure you have access to this action plan um, that we developed here at BSM. But I really like to organize things into a couple of different priorities. Number one, my red, my red is the items that really need priority attention. My green are kind of those medium priority items, and some things end up on green but then get moved up to red, just depending on what the doctor wants me to focus on. 
Uh, the blue is additional considerations, and then that orange is for compliance and areas that we need to update. And for each of these tabs in an Excel spreadsheet, we have the action item, the responsible party, and by the way, if you're the manager on this webinar, you, your name should not be the only one in the responsible party uh, box. <laughs> there has to be other folks in the practice that are helping you with this, um, but that's part of our job, right, is to figure out who that should be and to help delegate that. Um, the status, uh, the timeline, like when are we when are we trying to get this done by, and then notes. And I would meet with my physicians on a weekly basis to go over the action plan. We'd start off with the red items, and sometimes we only got through the red items, but they could then see everything else that they had told me to put on the list, and I could help manage um, all of these different areas within the practice. And when they told me, Elizabeth, we need to do X or we need to do Y, I would say, okay, and instead of it kind of going in my one ear and out the other, as it so often can do because we're so busy, I would immediately go and put it on the action plan. And that's just how I kept up with all of the different tasks they gave me. And then, you know, there were times when we could sit back and evaluate, do you really need us to do that? Should we be doing it? Um, but if I didn't capture it, you know, three months down the line, they'd be like, hey, why didn't we do this? And, you know, sometimes I didn't have a good answer if I really wasn't keeping track well for the practice. So this is something that I really, really um, encourage everyone to take, download, and start to use and implement within their practices. And Ryan, I've tried to leave a little bit of time here today for us to be able to pause here now and to be able to talk about some questions. So I'll just uh, turn it over to you to see if you have anything that um, our, our participants would really like to know. Definitely, I've got a couple of questions lined up for you already, and I'll use this opportunity, Liz, to um, remind everybody that's on the call as we wrap up today. We have a couple more minutes to get your question answered. In order to get those questions in, um, to go ahead, click Q&A. It's an icon at the bottom of your screen for most users. For a few of you on mobile devices, it may be located at the top. That will open a new window. You're going to type that question in. It will come up on my screen, and I've got a few of those lined up for you that I'll, I'll start with right now. Um, first question that's coming in is coming in from Lon, and it's a, a question about really the best way to secure OSHA training for their team, whether it be on-site or online. What's, what's your recommendation there, Elizabeth? So I do recommend going to the um, OSHA website and looking through those materials because each practice is going to be a little bit different. Um, there are some agencies out there that do provide specific OSHA training as well, and I'll just kind of share a couple of those with you. Uh, first of all, if you are a practice out there and you happen to be in an ophthalmology practice, uh, BSM Consulting does provide OSHA training through our BSM connection for ophthalmology distance learning center, but that's only for ophthalmology there. So I apologize if that's not uh, your specialty. Um, the other um, areas is there is a um, firm that helps with compliance training, and that's called Eagle Associates. And uh, I have a lot of practices that work with them and get their um, not only OSHA and HIPAA training through them, but um, also will um, you know, have them send them email reminders and do different staff training there. And that can be a wonderful resource. So I, I would look there as well. Um, and then uh, certainly I also always look to the societies. So, um, you know, Plastic Surgery Society, Dermatology Society, Adam, uh, just depending on uh, where you're located, you know, talk with folks in your specialty and find out where they specifically have found good training resources. Excellent. Now, this next one, Elizabeth, is coming in from Beth, and it, it's kind of a long question, so allow me to paraphrase. So it sounds like Beth is a, is a practice manager, and her physician owner is concerned that they're not doing enough to prevent um, uh, potential fraud or embezzlement or um, product loss or theft. Um, do you have tips for both the end of year financial accounting review and maybe specific policies that um, practices are using to avoid both of those issues? Absolutely. So first of all, one of the biggest keys for me is that monthly benchmarking. 
um, you know, really taking a look at your financial reports on a monthly basis, not just um, at the end of the year, but making that part of your monthly routine. The second piece of it is to go back through your collection uh, policies and procedures within your practice and just follow the money. You know, start with where, you know, patients are paying either at check-in or check-out and, you know, walk through your credit card statements. I also very much believe in a checks and balance system. So the same person that runs the credit card or who um, collects the cash payment from the patient is not the same person who makes the bank deposit or who reconciles the credit card payments in the PM system with the accounting and QuickBooks. There has to be some division in our billing um, uh, are in, in our billing processes. So you want to go back sure, back through and make sure of that. Um, you know, if you are thinking that there is something that's going on, um, you can hire an outside firm to come in and review all of your processes. But in reality, you know, they're not going to find something oftentimes just by a quick visit in. And you can do most of this legwork on your own, but it takes paying attention and reviewing all of your processes and again, putting those checks and balances into place. I always share with practices that, you know, when you have someone in billing, check out, um, something like that, um, where they're handling money in the practice and they're very protective of their position and of the knowledge that they have, that always gives me concern. I'm not saying they're doing anything, but it gives me concern. I was the COO of my practice and my, my office was next door to our bookkeeper. And when I would go over to get petty cash to go pick up some something at Office Max next door for the practice or something I needed for my office, I signed the log and I had the bookkeeper sign the log that I was taking money out of petty cash, even if it was only a $20 bill. We have to teach our teams to be very comfortable with us each being accountable. And if someone has a problem with that, then we need to address what that really is. Uh, because, you know, I'm an open book and I'm expecting everyone else in the practice who handles money to also be an open book. We're all okay with checking each other's work when we collect money. Excellent. Well, on that note, Elizabeth, it's time for us to wrap up. We had a couple of questions at the end that all dealt with the same themes, which is people are excited about the assets that you shared today. I want to reassure everybody on a couple of points. Um, Elizabeth has graciously allowed us to record today's webinar. It takes us just a couple of days to clean up the video and get it published to the web. Uh, within a few days' time, typically by Friday of this week, we'll transmit an email. The email will invite you to come back, watch the video. You'll be free at that moment to share it with um, uh, any of your colleagues that you like. The post will include, uh, Mona, for your question, a link to download that action plan that Elizabeth shared with you at the end. I'll also be sure that we reference the, uh, the blog on uh, the new compliance topics that was just released at BSM uh, that Elizabeth mentioned earlier in the talk. And Elizabeth, as we wrap up today, anything that uh, you would like to say for our audience as we conclude? I just wanted to thank everyone for being with us today. I hope this has inspired you to get things done. Uh, don't forget that when you do get things done to celebrate, <laughs> sometimes our victories are small, so we have to celebrate each and every one of them. And I just look forward to everyone getting 10 points for themselves. Excellent, Elizabeth. On behalf of myself and my entire team here at Interactive, we want to thank you and uh, your, uh, your team there at BSM for being generous with your time and uh, sharing today's topic with our subscribers. Thank you, Ryan. Bye-bye.